This is Father Gregory Pine. I'm a Dominican friar of the province of St. Joseph, and welcome back to the Thomistic Institute podcast for this most recent installment of Off-Campus Conversations. Uh, so the goal here is to follow up with the Thomistic Institute speaker who will have given an intervention at a campus or at a retreat or at a conference, so that way we can pursue the principles, the arguments proposed therein with greater rigor and vigor. Um, so today I'm joined by Professor V. Bradley Lewis from the Catholic University of America. Thanks so much for tuning in, or thanks so much for joining in, I should say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I don't know why I said tuning in. That would make you sound like a, a passive observer to an interview that you yourself are the protagonist <laughs> of. Um, but I'll learn how to use verbs at some point in my life. Today's not the day, though. Okay, so um, many of the Thomistic Institute podcast listeners will know you from past lectures that you've given, which have appeared on the podcast. Uh, for those who don't know you, though, would you just say a word of a word of introduction, who you are, where you're from, what you do? So I teach political philosophy at Catholic University uh, here in Washington. I've done that since 1997, and uh, I teach and write mostly about political, legal philosophy, ethics, things related to that. Okay, excellent. Um, so when people hear that, uh, they, they kind of situate it within philosophy or they situate it within political philosophy or within politics or PPE, what, what, what is the nature of the program that you have there at Catholic University of America? What's the kind of the shape of it? Well, in the School of Philosophy, right, we, we offer uh, undergraduate and graduate degrees in philosophy. And uh, our focus has always been primarily the history of philosophy, the great texts and the great thinkers in the history of philosophy. And within that, I teach a courses on political philosophy, focusing mostly on ancient and to some degree medieval, but Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas, um, and with also some some contemporary things uh, occasionally. <clears throat> okay. Um, so then let's turn then to the subject of the lecture that we're following up on, which is about rights and rights talk. Uh, so you highlighted for us the fact that rights talk is contentious. Um, not that one need feel ill at ease when broaching the subject, but just that there are a lot of people out there with very well formulated or at least strongly formulated opinions as to the provenance of rights talk, as to the applicability of rights talk, as to the future of rights talk. Um, and the proposal that you gave, you know, was was that rights talk is not incoherent with at least uh, one version of a kind of Catholic anthropology and legal theory, theory namely that of St. Thomas Aquinas. And so you you made efforts at, at sourcing uh, a theory of natural rights in the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas for an undergraduate audience, um, who then followed up with some good questions so as to uh, suss out the implications. I was thinking, uh, so to follow up, um, maybe start with our experience of trying to navigate conversations in which rights appear. So like I have a right to this and you have a right to that. Um, and then trying to determine why they become so um, problematized or why they become so difficult to navigate within short order. So maybe we can just start with, um, I don't know how to pronounce words, so it's either banal or banal, um, but whatever. Um, we'll, we'll start with a simple example, namely traffic laws. Um, so, so, you know, people will pose questions, kind of silly questions. If you come to a stop sign in the middle of an, uh, uh, what, like a, a very remote rural area at two in the morning, are you responsible for waiting the uh, the kind of stated amount of time? So here we're coming against like law and its prima facie force. Um, so thinking then in terms of the rights talk that we're going to to broach, um, you, you were proposing an image where rights issue kind of organically, as it were, from from a legal claim. So how would you describe that situation in terms of rights? Is that a fruitful way to think about it or an unfruitful way? In that particular example, yeah, I'm not sure um, thinking about it in terms of rights would be the best thing. I mean, we do it in terms when we talk about traffic laws, we do talk about right of way. I mean, that's a very kind of standard, you know, so you're at a four way intersection and the usual rule there is the person on the right goes first and then the next and then the next. And so you have a there is a kind of right uh, that operates there. And you, you could find situations like that in other examples of of traffic laws. The one thing about that example that's good, though, even if you think about that one very limited aspect of it is that, you know, the anxieties that people have about rights talk in a more general sense stem from 
situations in which claims are made about rights that are unclear and off, often kind of grandiose uh, and where it seems that that there are only rights, that, that the whole of our political vocabulary is only about rights. And a lot of people react against that for quite understandable ways, right? I mean, it can't be that it's only about rights and there's nothing else. And it can't be that rights are so vague and they tend to swallow up everything else. And so there's a legitimate concern about that and a worry about that. The problem is that if you sort of move from that legitimate concern to simply saying, well, so we have to get rid of this and we have to talk about something else. Let, let's just throw out rights, and, and because obviously that's that's a sort of individualistic way of speaking about things that doesn't take the community's welfare into account and so forth. Let's get rid of it. When in fact, what's what's better is is to try to be more specific about rights claims and to see what the overall context is, and also to see the other parts of our legal and political system, you know, that that are not simply about rights. So again, things like virtues, rules, the common good. Um, so my, my point is that there's a whole there of which rights are a part and, a, and mm -hmm. of which they're the context. <clears throat> and in the case of something like traffic rights, you, you've got an overall concern there, the common good and how it uh, is realized in circumstances when people are hurtling themselves at one another in, you know, five, 10,000 pound hunks of metal at high speed. And, and, and so that, you know, minimum of injury and death occur. And part of that story can be told in terms of rights, but a large part of it has to be termed in terms of other categories too. Okay, so we have in place this sense then of like the common good and the rule of law, which uh, helps to kind of define the frontiers of the common good or the bounds within the common good can flourish. And so, yeah, obviously rights isn't just gonna be, I auto legislate my own fancy. I don't want to stop at the stop sign. So I'm not going to stop at the stop sign. I will use the word right as a kind of smokescreen and move on. Okay, so then let's make it more urgent. Um, I just received a fine in the mail for 40 Swiss francs because I was driving in the canton of Obwalden. And in the canton of Obwalden, if you exceed the speed limit by more than three kilometers, uh, then you are, autom you know, like there are just lots of traffic cameras around and you're automatically sent a ticket. Um, which starts out relatively modest, but then gets increasingly devastating. Um, so that that caused me a kind of dismay. I'm just kind of, in, I'm like interrogating my own experience right now. Not that I would say it's unjust because, I mean, the Canton can do whatever it wants. And I, as an American, just because I have different sensibility as to what a speed limit is and how hard and fast it is, doesn't mean that I should, should auto-legislate. But... Um, you might might we have place here for rights insofar as like law could could threaten to become invasive or we we sometimes experience law as threatening to become invasive does does rights talk then enter in more or does it enter more intimately into the conversation well it's certainly uh it's certainly possible that that law can become invasive i mean if there is such a thing and i think there there are as natural rights at any time the positive law, the human law, interferes with those natural rights. And I mean, the different ways you can interfere with natural rights, I mean, one way would simply be to regulate, you know, one's exercise of natural rights. And there's certain circumstances under which that's legitimate. But but to simply remove or, or prohibit a person from exercising a natural right, that's a lot more problematic. Whenever law does that, then, right, it becomes unjust. And you have an issue about what to do in the face of unjust laws. I'm not saying that the traffic laws in Switzerland are unjust uh, at all. Um, they may well be perfectly just, um, uh, but but certainly that can happen. I mean, um, the, the the one involving uh, traffic that that I sometimes think about is you know when they do have these cameras. It's automatic. Of course, the United States, there's supposed to be a right to confront one's accuser. That's a constitutional right. It's not a natural right. It's a constitutional right. But if your accuser is a, you know, a camera, <laughs> uh, I think that could create a bit of a problem. But, um, but that's a that's a legal problem. <clears throat> OK. All right. So so then turning from thinking how the how the law impinges upon us. Now, maybe we think about how the law might motivate a response in us. Let's say I'm driving down the same whatever road in whatever canton, and I see somebody in distress. Now, that distress could be manifest in a variety of ways. Maybe their car's broken down and they just need help. Or maybe there's like clear signs of 
violence or trauma or some situation where somebody needs like help in order to maintain their bodily integrity. Um, okay, so so again, how how are rights language or how, how might rights enter into this conversation? Is it helpful or are we gesturing towards another aspect like things that you mentioned in the course of that conversation, like virtue and common good? What might be the place of rights in that particular situation? Yeah, again, that's a case where I wouldn't think rights would be the first way that you'd want to talk about it. So make it a little more concrete. There's a person in distress and you see them on the road and you pick them up and you put them in your car and you say, I'm going to take them to the hospital. And they're, they're in a lot of distress. So you speed, you go very fast to try to get to the hospital and you get stopped by the police or whatever. And they say, well, you're going too fast. And you explain, I have this very ill person. We're trying to get to the hospital. Um, I mean, it certainly would be unreasonable for the police to insist in a circumstance like that. Well, no, no, I'm sorry. You just you, you would five miles over the speed limit and you're, you know, you have to stop. And if you won't, you know, give show me your license and registration immediately, I'm going to have to take you in. In the meantime, this poor guy here is in extremis and so forth. Um, you know, a reasonable officer would say, let me help you. Let me escort you to the hospital or whatever. And, and I think under the circumstances, you could yourself make that decision. We need to go as quickly as possible. Why? Because ultimately, the final cause of law, the purpose of law is the common good. Uh, and the common good includes, uh, in a reasonable way, the, the conditions that promote the health and safety of everyone who lives in the community. And in a circumstance when a particular law leads to something that isn't the common good, it loses its, its rationality. And there are certain circumstances in which I think anybody is able to make a decision about that. Um, uh, so that kind of exception, a circumstance under which it clearly wasn't meant to apply. Um, and I think most people realize, but most people have a sense for that. <clears throat> okay. All right. So then <clears throat> these kind of mundane examples maybe help us to recognize uh, the limitations of rights. So you're proposing rights as part, you know, as like a, as a part, an integral part, which goes into constituting an integral whole, which integral whole is for you know, the good of the citizenry for the promotion of their virtue and tranquility and order. Okay. So then maybe, maybe we can turn briefly to how rights talk might uh, either impede or promote our kind of entry into the richness of that integral whole. And I think that this is where the anxieties that you mentioned that, that many people harbor come into play. Okay. So <clears throat> uh, to take the example of abortion, you know, you have a putative rights to like reproductive health, which comes into conflict with a right to life, you know, so the mother claiming a putative right to reproductive health, whilst the, the child has a right to live. Um, here, when you have a clear conflict of rights, um, how, how does one bring in those other principles of common law, or excuse me, common good law of virtue in a way that, um, yeah, can, can gain purchase or in a way not necessarily to think of it only in terms of convincing those present to, but 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 how can yeah how can we advance that conversation? Because I think a lot of people find themselves in that existential situation where they feel like these claims are just incommensurable and we're never going to advance. Do you find, you know, argumentative strategies or or different ways by which we can think through the problem more fruitfully? Anything to propose there? Yeah. So, one one way in which you can make sense of rights, you know, within a larger context. Um, and I mean, even just to give a clear account of what it is to have a right, I mean, what, what is a right in the most basic sense? You know, I think it's a, it's a three-term relationship. I mean, and that's a crucial point all by itself. Rights are relationships, relationships, mm -hmm. way to conceive of relationships between persons. So a relationship between one person, one or more other persons, and some, let's say, thing or act type could be either one, it relative to my ability to act in a certain way or relative to a piece of property or something like that. So you've got all three parts of that, and it has to be spelled out what, what they all are. In the case of something like abortion, a lot has to do with how we interpret what's going on. And a lot of the differences that people have about that have to do with the different interpretations. But certainly on one view, you've got two human lives involved. And Certainly, there's a moral norm that says one cannot intentionally take the life of the innocent. Uh, so there's a relationship between one person, one other person, uh, and uh, that 
the act of either taking a person's life or doing what's necessary to preserve that life. Um, and if there's an obligation never to intentionally take the life of another person, then that person has a right that their life should not be intentionally taken. I mean, there's a reciprocal relationship between those two things. Um, and, you know, it seems to me that's what we're talking about in the case of abortion. Now, somebody who disagrees with me, you know, I think, and I, again, I could be wrong about this. This is my perception. I mean, it seems to me that the purchase that that the right to abortion has in modern societies has a lot to do with the the right, the full rights of women to participate within society. And the arguments often made that you cannot have, you know, equality of rights for women without abortion. And so that has to be sorted out. I mean, it's, you know, either you think that follows or you think it doesn't follow. I think it doesn't follow for two reasons. One, there is a, a human being there, the child who has a right to live, but also uh, it's simply not necessary that the right to, to end that life is necessary to the equality of women to participate within society. That involves a lot of other things. And there's no necessary connection between those two things. Now, and I think the six, to the extent that we can say that the kind of abortion rights mood have been, has been successful is that they've simply convinced a lot of people that there is a necessary relationship between those two things, that you cannot have equality for women without abortion rights. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the part I think that you have to show is, is, is simply not the case. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, I heard a, a lecture that I think it was Angela Knoble gave on the Thomistic Institute podcast about abortion and abortion rights. And she spent a lot of time on this kind of burden argument that women bear a disproportionate burden when it comes to childbearing, child rearing. Uh, and as a result of which, they need this burden alleviated by a right to an abortion. So like you said, they can participate equally as members of a society. And what, what she said was that a good kind of argumentative, even rhetorical strategy was to recognize that there are disproportionate burdens that are placed all across society and it it doesn't necessarily just fall along you know sex or gender lines that it's um it's just a, a more complicated picture than that and she said that a good way by which to approach it was to valorize the good of those burdens born in the way in which you know you see a a soldier and you say thank you for your service so too you see a mother and you say thank you for their service not in like a this is sparta type way uh, obviously, you'd formulate it in a different manner, but you wouldn't look suspiciously on a on a woman who had three children under the age of four in the supermarket. Like, what's wrong with you? You would say, like, that's awesome. Um, now, do you think that you have in the other principles that you propose with like the natural law, with the common good, with virtue, like ways or sources uh, that we can begin to form as a society, as a polity, uh, some ways of of doing that, of valorizing those who bear burdens disproportionately, um, you know, like whilst on the lookout for certain injustices that might creep in, but but valorizing those burdens which they bear and their character for doing so? Yeah, I'm sure there are ways of doing that. I mean, it, and you can find precedents uh, for this historically. I mean, again, you mentioned Sparta. Uh, I don't want to go back to, to that. But, you know, there are in ancient Greek cities, um, women who died in childbirth were given commensurate honors to men who died in battle. Um, and all, all I mean by mentioning that is simply that the value of that burden, as, as you put it right, or the risk involved in childbirth was recognized as, as something that was of great importance to society. Um, and I'm sure we, we certainly could do a, a better job of, of recognizing that. Um, you know, we we do a better job of recognizing other sorts of burdens. I mean, you know, the burdens of soldiers, for example. But I think especially since 9-11, uh, the recognition that we give to police officers and uh, firefighters, uh, emergency service workers is much more than used to be the case. I mean, that's something that was really highlighted as a result of that. Um, but but mothers, but but also pe people in other positions who, who, again, bear a burden of a certain kind to care for other people, whether it's elderly parents or uh, other relatives. I mean, you know, those are all things that everybody should be grateful for and that we, we can and should do a better job of recognizing. Um, 
Um, okay, so may maybe then uh, when it comes to evaluating or it comes to arguing through like rights claims which are in conflict, um, I suspect that you know many people who listen to the podcast will have some familiarity with the work of Alistair McIntyre, and he says that we're not really actually having arguments. We're just holding to you know, kind of preconceived or preformulated notions and using rational speech as a way by which to bludgeon the opponent um, with the appearance that we're conducting something like a, a genuine dialogue. So maybe, maybe again, for those who are suspicious of rights talk uh, or of the value of rights talk in the public square, what are ways in which we can use it to good effect? Maybe kind of bring things out of the darkness into the light and help, um, you know, those who are privy to the conversation or participating in the conversation to be honest about the rights claims that they're making and, and kind of subject them as it were to public verification or falsification. How can we, how can we make the discourse more honest or more? Yeah. What's the word I'm looking for? More transparent. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I would say two things about that. What one is, um, that it's a mistake, I think, to act as if what's necessary here is to somehow translate these concepts into our own way of speaking. And wh why do I say that? Because I think in many cases, these concepts came from us, by which I mean people who've inherited the Catholic intellectual tradition. So, you know, rights are not simply something that's modern. Um, uh, and I mean, you can certainly find instances where St. Thomas, for example, was talking about rights. He doesn't have a big theory of it, as you said before, but there are certainly are subjective rights that he talks about. But even more than that, if you look into, for example, medieval canon law, well, there's a way even more of that stuff there. So I, I think in general, rights talk is not so much a function of, of modernity. I mean, that is talked about in a certain way is, but in and of itself, not so much as something that comes from a journey, something that comes from highly developed legal systems. Um, and I think wherever you've got highly developed legal systems, you've got the need to be very specific about the sorts of remedies that are available to certain kinds of wrongs and about the legal understanding of certain relationships. And we do have a highly sophisticated legal system in modern societies, but there was also a highly sophisticated legal system within the church in the Middle Ages, and there was rights talk within that legal system. So it's not something that we kind of have to sort of get used to. <laughs> it, it goes way back in our own tradition, right? I think that's very important. Um, but secondly, um, I think I disagree with Alistair McIntyre to this extent. Um, I don't think it's just, you know, kind of posturing or make believe. It, does, it certainly doesn't have to be. Um, often, you know, students want to know, you know, tell me what the argument is that's the silver bullet on this problem or this kind. And I always want to say, there are no silver bullets. All there is, is the continuous, never ending need to patiently, carefully make the best argument that you can. And there are always people who are not going to be persuaded by that argument, but there are some people who will. And the people who aren't persuaded, you know, you have to demand, okay, you tell me, what's your argument? And, and you patiently listen to it and you patiently respond and it'll make your argument better. And, uh, and ultimately, we'll, we'll see what happens. But there really is no alternative to that. I mean, the only alternative to arguing <laughs> is something that's a lot worse. Um, and so when people say, yeah, I mean, we're, we're just not getting anywhere with this kind of dialogue. So, well, what exactly is the alternative? Um, you know, I, I really don't see that there is any that anybody, and you think about it carefully, you really want any part of. Um, so uh, we just have to keep making the best argument that we can and, 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 and asking questions. Again, I think People often forego the opportunity when somebody makes one of these claims, you back off and say, well, wait a minute, you're going to have to explain that. What do you mean by that? Uh, and there's often a lot less there than, than it might seem like at first. Uh, <clears throat> okay, maybe uh, just in this last section, these last couple questions, we can turn briefly to religious liberty. It seems, you know, various authors have observed that religious practice has fallen among the ranks of goods enshrined, you know, among those goods prized by 
you know, political liberalism, uh, to speak somewhat imprecisely. But it used to be the case that there was a place for religion. At the very least, it was tolerated, but it seems at a certain level or in certain regimes that it was promoted as representing a good for the citizenry, whilst you know, politically liberal um, regimes tried not to take a stance vis-a-vis -vis one or the other concrete particular exercise thereof. It, it, it seems, at least in the West, and this is a kind of Westocentric claim, but um, it seems like in the West, the good of religious the good of religious belief and religious practice has fallen among the ranks in the hierarchy of goods. Maybe we can think just briefly about like how might we bring that back into the mainstream, or how can we uh, make manifest by life, by argumentation, the the good, the positive good, which religious belief and practice represents. Like, how do you see that going forward or progressing? Yeah. Well, again, I think there are there really are sort of two things here. There's a sort of basic kind of legal thing, and then there's something that goes well beyond that. Um, you know, there are all kinds of controversies now, legal controversies about religious freedom, and some of them are new. I mean, that, um, so for example, there are legal theorists who think it's a mistake that the U.S. Constitution includes a First Amendment that guarantees free exercise of religion. I mean, they think that was a mistake the founders made. Uh, freedom of association was sufficient. They shouldn't have singled out religion. Um, and that's mm -hmm. even, that claim has come up in legal cases. But but fortunately, what judges have done is said, well, <laughs> you may be right, you may be wrong, but the fact is there it is in black and white. It says religion. <laughs> and as long as it says it, yeah. um, it's been singled out and it's been protected on its own. And I think, you know, that you have to we have to stick with that. Um, and that does a lot of work. I mean, and, and has uh, uh, recently our tradition somehow, even nationally, our founders thought that it was a good and put it in the Constitution. And it's worth continuously asking why they did that uh, and why they thought that. And it wasn't, you know, so much because of a particular religious tradition that they adhered to. They thought there was something there that everybody could understand. And there's some good scholarship on this um, that's been done. But secondly, I think ultimately nothing like that um, is as powerful as simply displaying the beauty and wisdom of our own tradition. Um, and because you know, religion in the abstract, I mean, there is such a thing, you know, religion is a natural virtue for St. Thomas and his authority about it is Cicero. And so there is such a thing as, as natural religion as a kind of category, but there is no such thing as a natural religion, <laughs> right? There is a virtue of religion and you can talk about a good of religion, but whenever you want to talk about specific content, it's going to come from somewhere. And it either comes from God because it's a result of revelation or it comes from human beings and that it just emerged out of culture. But that content came from somewhere. And in the case of, 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 of the Christian religion, that content did come from God. It came from our Lord. And that's what has to be <laughs> emphasized, it seems to me. Um, you know, when people worry about all the things that are going wrong and and, and liberalism and modern society and all the problems that we associate with that, it, it, it seems to me, ultimately, there's nothing more, we have to believe, we have to believe there's nothing more powerful than the gospel. And, uh, you know, constantly focusing on that will have effects that go well beyond uh, religion in any kind of narrow sense. So there, there has to be a legal protection for these things. And we have a way of understanding that within our own national legal tradition. And I think that has to be understood better. But ultimately, there's a much more positive strategy here, which is just the beauty and wisdom of our of our tradition uh, within the, of the Christian religion, which I think the more, you know, when people see it for what it is, uh, they can recognize the goodness of it. <clears throat> um, okay, maybe for a last question or two, I'm thinking about the kind of industry that has grown up around outrage. Uh, so you have like first order outrage and second order outrage. So it's, it strikes me that a kind of typical move of the left is to be outraged at the intolerance or the backwardness or the obscurantism of the right and to leverage that outrage as a way by, to which, by which to advance whatever rights are 
are at stake. And then it seems like a kind of second order outrage is that deployed by the right, which beholds um, this, whatever you would call it, you know, um, this first order outrage, and then makes it an object of kind of like scorn or mockery so as to promote a kind of retrenchment. It, it, it strikes me that in the internet age, the second order outrage has become a kind of self-reinforcing industry. Like it's enough. It doesn't seem to, to necessarily have a positive project. It's just like, uh, look how dumb they are. Full stop. Subscribe to the channel. Um, so, so, so my question is, you know, like, I, I think that this is some people's association with rights talk. It's that it's just outrage, whether first order or second order, and that it doesn't really, it doesn't really promote a positive project. On the one hand, the first order outrage is just kind of nihilistic. It seems pretty motivated to just tear down. And on the other hand, um, it, I, I don't know that it escapes from a similar sort of nihilism. It's just a, a crankier sort. Um, so, so like for those, you know, who might be interested in, and making these types of arguments or participating in these types of conversations, what would you say? So like you gestured towards it in that last point about the practice or the belief and practice um, of those, you know, who espouse, you know, like the Christian religion. But what are, what are positive ways in which to engage this type of debate, you know, like leveraging rights types claims, but within the setting of the common good and of the, the rule of law and of the virtues which are to be sought therein, whilst not getting, you know, kind of getting lost in the outrage? Yeah. Uh, well, that's a very good point. I, I mean, one thing is simply, um, you know, I mean, I, again, it's a simple question, but I often, you know, tell students, you know, when we talk about these things, consider the alternatives. What are the alternatives? Uh, you know, if you just think about rights and rights talk, do you want to live in a society that does not protect fundamental human rights? There are such places. I mean, you could move. To, there's some places you could move to <laughs> where they don't really care about this. And as you know, badly as that's sometimes managed in our own society, there are places where it's a lot worse. And so the question is, you know, you want to get rid of it or do you want to make it better? And, uh, you know, so so let's try to figure out ways to make it better and to make it more intelligible pe for people to, to help them to understand these things. I think that's a much better strategy. Um, a lot of the outrage um, is, you know, uh, on social media and so forth. Um, and there, you know, again, something else I often tell students, you know, my, my advisor in graduate school once was asked about his work and he kind of half jokingly said, well, I don't really work. Um, I read books and I talk to people. And uh, I remember thinking about that, thinking, wow, that's really great. But then it, over time, it seemed to me that it's even more important. And I, but I often tell you, you want to get out of this cycle of outrage and, and, you know, the way people behave on social media and so forth. Here's my advice. Read books and talk to people, <laughs> right? Don't, don't just read, you know, Peter, people's Twitter uh, posts, or blogs, you know, whatever. And, and, and don't just communicate with people through that mode. Read real books and talk to real people. It's much harder to treat real people <laughs> the way people are often treated on social media uh, when you're sitting in front of them um, and talking to them. And you also learn a heck of a lot more. Um, so I, I would much rather people spend more time reading real books and talking to one another um, you know, even people with whom they disagree, I mean, uh, right, especially people with whom they disagree, um, then this kind of disembodied communication through these networks that frankly encourage outrage and often superficiality, you know, who could come up with the cleverest put down, you know, who can rally the team, you know, most vigorously, again, without any real illumination emerging from it or anybody, you know, re really opening up to, to some truth they hadn't seen before. Okay, maybe um, just a, a final thought then about the ties that bind. Um, so we just kind of gestured in the direction of how our political arrangements are are kind of saved, uh, to speak fast and loose by by our our ecclesial arrangements. You know, like you, you, you get a kind of vantage on your political, your political engagement uh, from the setting of your, your ecclesial engagement. You know, it's just like like religious belief and practice kind of breathes life into political engagement or investment. I'm thinking now in terms of like we, we often 
are in a relationship that is elective when we're navigating rights claims or involved in rights speech. We're, we're trying to manage these intermediate institutions or trying to manage these elective relationships. But, but I'm also thinking of how we as a society are losing hold of the non-elective dimensions of our personality and of our association. So like, you know, he's not my president or he's not whatever, you know, it's like we have ways of distancing of ourselves that are from things that are common. So maybe could you just say a word then about, yeah, I don't know, whatever that that sparks in your imagination, but the, the non-elective dimension of of rights, you know, speech or, 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 or rights talk and how that might help orient the conversation further. But by non-elective, you, you mean things we didn't choose or? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, I mean, many of the most important relationships that we have are like that. Um, and I mean, just to think about the 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 parts of your life where and the relationships that, that make up your life that you didn't choose. I mean, you just wound up in a certain place at a certain time with a group of people who you never would have imagined that you were with. It's an enormous part of, of what we do. And yet at the same time, uh, it's not just that you have to get along with people, but that there are certain goods that, that, that you certainly want to participate in, but, but you couldn't without them and, and without working with other people in various ways. I mean, where we work, uh, you know, but, but all kinds of other associations and relationships that we have. Um, and, you know, ultimately the connection, which is an intimate connection between the common good and the good of each person, to a large extent, is in those relationships, right? It, it's in those very relationships where the good of another person is connected to my good through some relationship that we have. And a lot, I, I, would, I dare say most of those are not chosen, not elected. Um, and so, uh, again, that, this is the big problem ultimately with individualism, right? In, in the bad sense that we often see with it. it it's just false. It's mythical, <laughs> uh, right? I mean, it, it's the idea that each person is somehow completely separated and can live in a way that's completely separated with respect to their will and their choices and everything else from other people. It's just not true. And it never has been. And it couldn't possibly be. Um, so then the only question is, how do you manage the relationships that you're necessarily in that you have no control over? And, and, and what really contributes to your good and the good of everyone else, given those things? And uh, you start from that, and it's a much more realistic picture of human life. And again, I think you explain that, and most people can understand it, rather than these abstractions that really have nothing to do with our ordinary experience. Yeah. Okay. That, that's going to be one of my takeaways from this conversation individualism is mythical. <laughs> That's tremendous. I'll, uh, I'll get that on a shirt and I'll wear that shirt frequently under my habit. I want to, so I want only to I will know of its existence, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which will be enormous. One of my cousins had a math teacher used to tell the students, guys, if you only knew I make hundreds of dollars. <laughs> Uh, okay. Well, well, thanks so much for taking the time. Um, if folks want to follow up, um, or if folks want to, to read more on this particular theme, do you have things that you've written or things that you might recommend that they could, uh, pursue? Uh, well, uh, I'll just recommend two things. I mean, if we're talking about rights, uh, one thing is, uh, a, an article that was published, uh, I think in Novet Vetera by one of your confreres, Father Dominic Legg, I think it's called, Do Thomists Have Rights? which I think probably emerged from a Thomistic Institute lecture. It's a very fine article. Um, but also uh, a thing that was particularly Im important for me in thinking about these things was the chapter on rights in John Finnis's book, Natural Law, Natural Rights, uh, where, again, he just goes through a lot of uh, legal and moral examples and very patiently kind of untangles things and tries to get at exactly what's, what's important in those relationships and how to think about rights in a way that isn't, doesn't assume a kind of false individualism. Um, and uh, anyway, I think those those two things would be a great place to, to start. <clears throat> okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, turning then now to you, the listener, thanks so much for having tuned into this episode of the Thomistic Institute podcast. Um, so we'll continue to have off-campus conversations throughout the course of the summer. I mean, these episodes are all basically evergreen. So whether you listen to them in the summer or in the fall, or in the winter, or in the spring. It's all good. Okay, so um, 
yeah, that's that's all we have for you for this. So know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us. And we'll look forward to chatting with you next time on the Thomistic Institute podcast.